Yo, this is Mark Curry. I want to give a shout out to my boy, Mikey T, the movie star. You know, you are what you say you are, a TV star. Mark Curry, I appreciate you joining me today for this exclusive interview. You know, you've got a detailed book currently available, How Puff Burned the Bad Boys of Hip Hop, Dancing with the Devil. Can you tell me why you decided to release the book and how the process was to get getting it made? Okay. The reason why I released the book was because it, it, it came to a point in time where I felt like my career and the dreams that I set out for myself weren't going to be accomplished, like dealing with the current situation that I was in. And I was like, in order for me to move on, I think that I'm going to have to leave this business venture or whatever it may have been with Puff. And I have to go do other things in life. And I have to just change me because I was spending too much time trying to be this rapper that I was like, man, you spent so many years trying to be a rapper. You didn't spend enough time trying to be more creative, like the things that you're able to do. And you forgot about yourself. So I was like, man, I started writing the book and I was like, let me write this book, which was just a memoir of my life. And I was like, let me just write down all the important things that I was able to witness with my eyes or experiences in life that you know I was able to be there for. And I said, I'm gonna write a story about it. And it ended up being my book. The first, it was called Black Heaven. And I called it Black Heaven because it was like everybody who was a part of this book was someone who's trying to reach for success or we're all trying to get out of this, this like the crab in the bucket situation where we're all trying to get out. So it was like a black heaven where a lot of dreams that, you know, didn't come true for people who are dreamers. It's just a black heaven. It was different. And that's what the name of the book was originally. But then when I got with um, the, uh, I, I met a, um, uh, I had to have a literature, uh, what they call them? Uh, some, a literary agent. I had a literary agent. So when I got a literary agent, the literary agent was the one that would introduce me to the um, publishing companies who I was hoping that would give me a publishing deal to release the book. But every letter that I got back from the publishing company was a decline because they said that some of them would say things like, um, it's a great story, but we don't want to have anything to to do with it because we have a one he's our client and you like he's our client so in the business world everybody deals with each other in that business world so what they meant was you know puff daddy is a client of ours so why would we help you at universal books or random house publishing why would we help you to write a book about someone that we currently have business dealings with. So I was like, okay, this is not going to work. So I said, I'm going to have to self-publish this book. And <laughs> my literary agent was Jeff and Deborah Herman. And I don't, I'm a, I'm a, this is going, this is going to trip you out. Jeff and Deborah, uh, Jeff and Deborah Herman was, they have something to do with that movie, The Secret. And it's really interesting to watch because it teaches you about how powerful you are and the things that you can do in order to, to accomplish the things and the dreams that you're reaching for in life. It's, so it was a story about a guy named Jack Canfield. Canfield is called Chicken Soup for the Soul. Have you ever heard of that? Yep. Okay, now this guy was shopping his book and couldn't get a deal. And he put a million dollar check on the ceiling of his, in his bedroom. So every night he went to bed, he would stare at the ceiling and see that million dollar check. And then one day he made a million dollars off his book. He broke the price down and self-published it. And then after he made a million dollars, his wife said, well, if you can use that 
technique to get a million dollars. Let me see you use that technique to get $10 million. And then he kept going on and on and on. And he became rich off of his endeavors and he became successful. So with that being said, I had to self-publish the book and my literary agent was the same literary agents that helped him. And they couldn't, they couldn't sell his book, Chicken Soup for the Soul. And he said, I have to self-publish it. So the same literary agents were my agents and they saw, they sought after me. And um, because I was, I was, you know, doing pretty big with the book when I first released it. And I was on like Wendy Williams and I was on uh, uh, Ed Lover and 107. I was all over. I was in California on all the radios there, South Carolina, man, I just did them all. And um, the literary agent couldn't sell the book, so I self-published it. And then when I self-published it, that was one of the best moves that I could ever make in life. Yeah, the deal that they want to give you on self they say it's a 60-40 deal. 60% us, 40% you. You'd be like, I wrote a book about my life and you're going to make more than me? No, I don't want you making more than me off of my story. That's it. That's how that book went. So what year did you start writing the book and what year did you ultimately get it published? I started writing the book in um, probably like 2005, I think. It took me three years. I wrote it, I started in 2005 and it took me three years to write. Because, you know, uh, you I, I, I would write and sometimes you have to take a break from the way you're thinking and what you're writing about and you have to recalibrate <laughs> so you can come back in a different form. So you say, okay, in order for me to really express the people, especially about a book chapters involved, I have to give them different levels of me. So you can't just talk about it all at once. Some things you got to think about and you say, you know what, I want to think just for a month and just build positive thoughts for a month. And then I want to talk about it two months later. So it, it takes a long time sometimes to, to deal with yourself in order to pull the greatness out of yourself, the best stories out of yourself. You have to, it takes time. And sometimes you have to let certain things about you kind of like die. So certain things about you can live. So you can have certain things about you that dominates everything you are. So it's, it, it's, it, it, took, it was a process to write that book. It was a long process, but I did it. So did you ever get that call from Diddy when the book was ultimately really released? And he was like, hey, don't put out this book or, hey, put out this book through Bad Boy. Nah, no call. Um I only talked to him on the phone two times since I released that book. I might have saw him maybe five times since I released the book. But that was it. That was the end of that. And just something that I, I, I you know, I'm, I can accept it. I don't have to, I don't have to have certain friends in life in order to feel, you know, to feel valid, I don't have to validate my myself through friendships. I validate myself with my hands and the things that I can do, what I can think of. Like when I wrote a book, a lot of people be like, yo, um, what happened to you? And I'd be like, well, if you read my book, you would know what happened to me. Instead of me writing music, I wrote a book. And then I did something that's like, I always tell people this when I say, you know, the Bible is like one of the oldest books and the number one selling book in the world. And it's never going to stop selling. And that's the amazing thing about books. They'll never stop selling. Music gets old. Books never get old. So I, I said I wanted to get my crown while I was still here. And I wrote the book. And that's been bigger than music. It's bigger than music. 
So I want to take it back to the start because you got a very interesting story, you know, from your life as a child growing up with parent close to the industry. You know, you went through some wild events as well as a young adult, and you eventually ended up on television as a part of one of the biggest labels in the music industry as a whole. It's an amazing rodeo ride, man. But you know, that is that's what it was. Where it all, I mean, what part, how do you want to dig into this? You moved around quite a bit. Where would you consider yourself to be born and raised? Um, I was born in New York. I was raised in New Jersey, in Teaneck, New Jersey. That's around the Isley Brothers in Teaneck. That's New Jersey. Nice place. I found the interesting things about me in Mississippi, Macomb, Mississippi, Beartown, Tylertown. I lived in a trailer and uh, I went to school. I went to uh, South Pike and I went to Pike High, well, Pike. And then after that, when I found that, you know, me, and I was really in tune with me because in Mississippi, the stores would close at like three o'clock in the afternoon. You couldn't go to the grocery store. So the only thing you could do is like fish or hunt. And so every day around three o'clock, I would fish. And it would just be me that lives in the, in this trailer with my brother and his wife. And so the only thing I could do is feed dogs. Um, walk. I had a horse. So I had to train my horse, I'd walk him around, put the bit in, whatever. And then I would... Um, I would uh, fish. And when I would fish, it would be nothing but silence. And I would just be there trying to fish and catch something with worms. And then I, I was like, man, that was the best time I had to really talk to myself, to really learn me. And I, I would have conversations with me and be like, what do you want to do? Like, you know, and I was like, man. And and I, I was at such a peaceful mindset that it was almost like, I don't want to be nowhere else other than doing what I'm doing right now because I love being with me doing this. And I'm like, you don't want to be that? You don't want to be a star on TV? You, I, I don't want to be none of that. I want to be me right here. And then after I learned that about me, that's when I knew I had something. Then I moved to Atlanta. Then when I moved to Atlanta, I went to this school called Lakeshore with like Dallas Austin and Divine Steven. It was all of these stars. The Kevin Wells went to another school. Dallas even went to their school. I don't know, it's a long story. And then, so, you know, you had Chip and you had all of these Highland Place monsters and you had LaFace Records and you had Itchy Bear, you had MC Bree. It was a melting pot of nothing but entertainers here. It was a capital. And I, um, I moved here. And then that's when I was able to utilize the gift that I found in Mississippi. Your first girlfriend was Muhammad Ali's daughter. Can you tell me, did you ever get a chance to meet Muhammad Ali? Yeah, I met Muhammad Ali. But when I met Muhammad Ali, it's a crazy question. I don't want to be long with it on this interview, so I'm going to try to give you some shorter versions, but I love to talk on things like this. But... <laughs> Muhammad Ali, Muhammad Ali used to um, park his car on the top of the way on the top of the block. Where I come from, we had blocks. So it was this block, then go down block, your block. So we'd be like, yo, I, I'm going to meet you on your block. Or we going to come over to your block. That means we coming over to your house. It was your block. So we on your block. So, you know, um, he would park on the top of the block at the gas station and then walk down the block to go to a house. So I used to see him. I'd be like, I'd be like, Muhammad Ali is parking his car on the top of the street and then walking down the street to Mia house. I was like, ah, oh. I said, okay, cool. I rolled up to him on my bike. I'm like, yeah. I was like, um, I was like, yeah, I, I, he was talking to me. And I was like, um, you know, I go with your daughter. I said, yeah, I'm your daughter's boyfriend. He was like, oh, yeah. I was like, yeah. And he, I was like, do you know my dad? And he was like, no, nah, I don't know your dad. I said, you know what? I'm going to introduce you to my dad. 
And I go and I'm just riding the bike and he's just sitting there. And then I rode with him all the I was like, so why do you, why'd you park your car up on the top of the block and then walk down? He said, because if I pull the car up to the house, all of the neighbors is gonna know it's me. And then they're gonna come to the house and I'm not gonna get a chance to spend with my daughter because everybody gonna be knocking on the door because they see the car. So he was like, so I leave the car up there and then I walk down the street. So then when he was walking, I walk with him all the way down to her house and then he'll go to the door and go in and then I ride off. That's how I met Muhammad Ali. My brother told me one time, he said Muhammad Ali picked him up and asked him what did he want to be when he grew up and he didn't know what to say. He said Muhammad Ali put him down fast. <laughs> I read in your book, Breakdancing was something that you did. Yes. What happened to that whole B-boy era? You know what I mean? Why do you think nobody breakdances anymore? You know, I miss graffiti. They still breakdance. It's just not, because breakdancing was a form of hip hop back in the days. We didn't really have hip hop. So it was like everything that we had difference wise between us and other individuals, different blocks was through breaking. So you'd be like, who, whoever dances the best and can rap the best and wins the talent show at the end of the year, wherever, that's who the winner is. So you'd be like, yo, it was us against Hackensack, Inglewood. I'm from Teaneck. We was going at it. We put tennis fly, uh, uh, anything, Bergenfield, anything. We was doing it. And that's where, when hip hop really, it was really break dancing. So I used to pop lock. And my little brother used to windmill. He used to be the fastest windmiller you ever see before in your life. He spin, he looked like the Tasmanian devil. He was little, and then he spin on his head, do like that, boy, I pop lock. We was winning. We used to go to the rink, remember the rink? It was a skating rink called the rink in New Jersey. Everybody was in New York and New Jersey used to go to the skating rink called the rink, right? The rink was in Bergenfield, New Jersey. And right before the rink became the rink, it was a bowling alley, right? And my father owned a restaurant right on the corner, right? A T-neck road, and I think it was, uh, 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 not Forest Avenue, it was the, the street that the Isley Brothers lived on, right down, if you go down this street, the Isley Brothers live right there. It's where their house was, and then it leads into Inglewood. So my father's restaurant was right there. Um, and, and and then the rink was next door and it became the rink. But when it first became the rink, we was the first ones in there. We had we held all our talent shows and everything in the rink. You said you wanted to make your dad proud by someday becoming an entertainer. You know, the dream that got away from him. When did you first discover that that was something you could actually do? <laughs> well... The older I get, I realize that I can't accomplish a lot of things that my father accomplished until I work hard and actually accomplish them. Simple things like he grew to be an older man. And in order for me to 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 live up to my his expectations or even my mother's expectations, the first thing I have to do is take care of myself and make sure that I spend time pursuing the right dreams and things like that, focusing and you know, again, it's it's hard. I lost my mother and father. I know you was going to probably get to that, but I lost them. But when I lost them, I realized that it just it was more responsibility for me as a person who still had life. So now I I have to live for them. So when you talk to me, you're not, not just talking to me. You, you know, I could just might be the mouthpiece of me, but who I am consist of my mother, my father, my grandfather, my grandmother, their mother, their father, and everybody that ever had something to do or DNA that is in my blood, it's up to me to make sure that I live to make sure they live. So when did you first decide that you could do music on your own? When I, I was taking stories and I would like what I would do is I would listen to someone like Biggie Smalls or I would listen to Tupac. And then I would be like, if I was sitting next to them and we were rapping together and they said, Mike is yours, 
I got to be just as hot as them. So I, I would always say that whatever you're saying, if it's not as hot as what somebody else is saying, or if not hotter, then you can't say. And then you realize things like Snoop did one, two, three, and to the four. Snoop Doggy Dog and Dr. Dre is at the door. You was like, well, how lyrical is that? You'd be like, that's some real simple stuff. But when they put it together with the music, and then they said that it made a whole bunch of sense. So then I realized that music wasn't just about saying something. Music was about melody. Music was about feeling. So whenever you say something, as long as you're saying it with feeling and people can feel it and understand it, that means you have something hot to say. But when you're saying something and people can't feel it, so I started writing lyrics and my lyrics was real. And when I, when people used to hear them, it used to shock. They used to be like, wow, did you hear what you just said? Like I used to have songs I, I wrote, like, you know, the mind of a man, that's the mind of a man that kills. And, and it was talk, it was a song that I wrote about the mind of a man and how a man thinks that makes him do the things that he does. And how can a man avoid thinking about things or doing certain things? Or how do you avoid situations to where I'm so mad that I want to hurt something? How can I avoid that situation? It was the mind of a man. And I wrote that song and people used to hear that and be like, wow, that was more like poetry. And then I realized that my lyrics weren't songs, they were poetry. I was a poet. In your book, the depiction of selling crack is that it'll lead to getting wads of cash. Now, I can imagine that, you know what I'm saying? Getting mad 20s from mad fiends. But you said when you got put on and, you know, got put on in front of a housing complex, you kind of had issues. Can you tell me about your time selling? And you said I had a hard time making sales. Funny. You are funny. You are funny. My father told me, he said, Mark, you are the worst drug dealer I ever seen. And please leave it alone. It's not for you. I was like, and it hurt me. And I was like, damn, dad, why would you say that? Because my father was everything. But it was certain situations like I would trust uh, 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 somebody who wanted crack or something. I would trust. They'd be like, um, can I get some crack? And then I'll be right back. I got to go cash my check. But you can hold on to my my uh, purse until I come back. And I would be there like, OK. So I'd be sitting there all day with this purse. I never went in it because I'm, I'm not going to go in this lady's stuff. And I'm like, man, I'm, I'm sitting there holding it all day. And then finally, when my friend would be like, man, open it up and see what's in there. And you open it up and it's a brand new thing. She just done stole it and gave it to you. You thought it was her purse? That ain't her purse. I went through that. So then, and then they used to knock on my door and then at my door of my house. And then that's when it really went bad. And then my, my brother, my, uh, my sister's husband, he went into the closet one day and I was stashing crack in, the, in my closet. And then the heat was in the closet and it melted up all the crack. So then every time I looked at it, it looked like butter. And then I had to put it in the freezer so I just gave it up, man. I just said, you know what? I'm just going to try something else. <laughs> that was my experience with it, you know, and that's just what it was. I'm too nice, I think. That's crazy. Yeah. Your dad's got to tell you you're a bad dealer, man. Yeah, he told me, he was like, Mark, drug dealing ain't for you. And I'm just going to be the first to let you know, leave it alone. And those words, man, I'm telling you, I still hear him saying it to me. And then I still remember. So every time I get, uh, when I'm around something that I know is not a part of me, I have to say to myself, I'm not a drug dealer. You know, I dabble here and there with a whole bunch of hustles in life, weed and every, all that kind of stuff. But that's not with Mace. You cannot, like, some, at one point you got to say, I cannot build a life off of the life that I'm living. I cannot be comfortable forever when I'm 60, 80, 90. Once you get 60, all of the friends that you used to sell weed and stuff to, they be done died. So you'd be like, damn, this because we getting older, I done lost half of my clients. 
how you gonna survive? And then by the time you get 70, it's only you and a friend. You'd be like, damn, we the only two. You wanna buy some weed? You know, you <laughs> like you don't have nobody to sell it to no more. So as you grow in life, certain thing changes about a man. And we can't be afraid to embrace those different things. Sometimes we get scared. Some Man, you got to learn how to build with your hands. You have to learn how to create something to sell. That's my, 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 my message I say to everyone. Create something to sell with your hands or with your mind. That's the true test of a man. But yeah, I wasn't good at it. That's what's up, man. You know, even Tupac struggled, you know what I mean, moving packs. Not everybody's going to have the 50 cent story, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I definitely, you know, even though I was still around a lot of it, I just was like, you know, my part might just be to drive. Like, I'd be like, I don't, I don't want to go out there and deal with the person who the hand to hand, he needs this and I got this. I ain't never... I think I think I may have got robbed once or twice. And I was like, you know what? It just ain't for me, man. Cause you think that you trust people. You'd be like, man, I'm trusting you to help you make money. And you want to take something from me? Like I can just help you make money. Why would you want to take something from someone who can help you make money? And it confuses you because you trust sometimes. You'd be like, man, I trust you. And I know that, you know, we can we can create new new changes for our, ourselves. And it just never pans out right. Well, let me get this up. You got robbed out there, like gunpoint, or more just like, yo, hold on to this. I've been robbed a few times, right? Nothing to, you know, but one time I got robbed by the police. So what? Let that go. Another time, I got robbed by the police. <laughs> Let that go, right? Things like um, I'm riding down the street in the car. I got money. I think I might have about eighty thousand. And the police pulled me over and they asked me specifically, "Did I have any money in the car?" I said, "No, sir." And they said, "Step out the car. Step out the car." And then they searched the car. Then they said, "Well, what is this?" I said, "It's money." And then. I was like, damn, well, how the hell did they know that I had money in the car? I was like, I got to stop telling people what I'm doing. That's when I realized that it was nothing wrong with me trying to get money. It was just something wrong with me trying to get money around the people I was around. Got to change it up, get money somewhere else. So in 1992, you witnessed the Goody Mob, then known as the East Point Chain Gang, get booed off the stage before going gold three years later. They reinvented themselves. How did yeah. that make you feel to see that? To see that, to know CeeLo Green, to know Cujo, to know Big Gip, man, especially Big Gip is, man, and Cujo too, and CeeLo, the Timo Goody, all of them, man. Like it was, it was a, it was great to see them and to know them when they were aspiring artists that wanted to become, and then to notice and see them after they accomplished what they were looking for. And even today, like the, even they they didn't wasn't as big back then as a lot of major groups, but as far as them staying together and still being the Goody Mob to this day, and the longevity of the Goody Mob is something that I wish we could see in Mob Deep. They see, I see something in them that you don't, you, it's rare that you see in a lot of groups. I see togetherness. I see that they all feel like we always gonna need each other. We gonna be here for each other. They don't, they don't, uh, other than CeeLo used to go do his own songs. And it was times I would wonder, like even if he was Nas Barkley, um, why didn't he have Goody uh, or CeeLo or Cujo rapping on anything? It's like he just went to being a whole nother individual, you know. And I seen uh, I seen uh, Lil John do that. I seen Lil John used to be in the studio all the time and all of this, and 
he was the uh he was doing the uh working for the record label and then he was okay and the next thing you know he used to ride around in a little white corvette and the next thing you know he moved to los angeles and he never really came back it's like everybody got famous and rich out here but when they got famous and rich, they went off to do what they was dreaming about doing instead of dreaming about, you know what, let me stay here, right here and help the individuals that are around me so they can see what I'm seeing too. I don't want to be the only one that know what it feels like to ride on this yacht. Some people, they want to be the only one to know the feeling. I want everybody to know what it feels like. So your first night on open mic you said in your book that you were compared to biggie i yes. want to ask when did you first get the chance to meet biggie and who was it that compared you to biggie um when we used to have these ciphers at the rim shop which everybody thought was owned by eric sermon but it was the rim shop my man shout out my man greg and them from detroit um so i always have to give that respect we used to have these ciphers where it'd be Keith Murray, Redman, Eric Sermon, it'd be me, it'd be Montana White, it'd be Jamal from Illegal, Malik, it'd be uh, Joe Riz, man, it'd be everybody's out there freestyling. And then when I would rap, everybody would rap, but when I would rap, People would listen to me and they wouldn't, they wouldn't come in trying to act like, well, let me take over because he's whack now. They would just sit and listen to me rap. And then I'd be like, damn, well, no Too Short would be there. One of the first artists that ever wanted to sign me was Too Short. He wanted to sign me to Dangerous Music. But for some reason, it, it was just going too slow. Or I felt like in order for me to sign the, the Too Short, I was going to have to sign through the rim shop. And I was like, I didn't really want to sign through nobody. I just wanted to have my my own, you know, be independent and not dependent upon anyone to, you know, and then I thought that that was going to happen when I got to Bad Boy, but that wasn't what it was. So one day I got off, I was freestyling one time. And when I got done, somebody said, yo, Curry, you sound just like Biggie. And I was like, yeah, and that was a compliment. So I'm telling you, every time I wrote a song, I wrote a song to outdo somebody else who was good at it. So if Biggie was hot, I don't know, I think it was who shot you, separate the weak from the opposite, lead hard to creep them Brooklyn streets. It's so all of that stuff. I'm going to take that same verse and I'm going to flip it and I'm going to make it mine. And I'm going to battle him. That's how I was. So when I met Biggie, it didn't mean anything to me. I want, I was ready. I was ready to battle. It's like when I met Black Rob. When I met Black Rob, we went right, met each other doing the muscle game. You understand? We was doing muscle game. I walked in the studio, I said, Black Rob, this is Mark Curry. I said, what's up, Black Rob? And then he was like, boom, they was like, we working on this song. You got something that could go with this? I was like, yeah. I, I was like, boom. Um, um, Think you can destroy this empire? We built from scratch, you stupid. I wouldn't care how ruthless your crew is. I got the fence for this area. Try to attack mad niggas on the barrier, just trying to blast back, bitch. There'll be no giving and no taking. Definitely no breaking laws we lay down here's the situation. We did that song, it was over. Then Black Rob liked my style so much he was like yo i got a group called alumni yo curry i need you an alumni can you tell me about first meeting puff daddy in 1995 was it at the platinum house yeah i met puff yeah i think i met him at the platinum house but i ain't really meet him he was just there i ain't it wasn't like hey here's puff daddy he's a great person it was just like he just he's this here he's a part we having a party tonight, he's here, and that's it. I was like, he's still, I'm still checking his ID, I don't care. I'm not saying I'm checking his ID, but you know, I, I when I met him, I was working the front door at the club. Right, you had so, gotten a job at the club, and you said that you didn't expect to be the doorman. What other position did you think they had in mind for you, or what would you have liked to have been doing at that point? I think I was doing everything. I liked it because it was my friends in, in my friend's club. So I had keys to it. I go when I want to, leave when I want to, do what I want to. I 
I did everything. If the trash cans was full, I'm taking them out. I'm checking IDs. I'm doing everything, man. I'm cleaning the kitchen, helping cook in the kitchen, whatever it is I need to do. That's what I did. Going to the store to get whatever we need from the store. That was me. Yeah, that was just my 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 dedication. It's how I dedicated myself to their dream at that time. I'm play a part. That's what I did. I met Puff Den, but Again, I didn't meet him uh, as far as him wanting to sign me as an artist until years later. So you ran into Bobby Brown a few times. Did he ever bring yeah. Whitney? Who? Whitney? Yeah. I think I did see Whitney a few times too. But again, like every in Atlanta, it's kind of like different way the way I came up from because nobody was really like, we didn't have no other than like George Clinton. He used to come around, that was hot. And then people used to produce songs with him in the studio, like Too Short in them and George Clinton. George Clinton was dope. Red Man in them, so he was dope. Um, but other than that, you know, if it was Whitney or Bobby, they regular, cause I knew uh, Clay and I knew Irv, which were his friends. And then I knew, I knew Bobby's sister uh, and all of this. I, I I used to talk to his sister, but I couldn't because she looked so much like Bobby. I was like, nah, I don't, I don't really like, I don't want to date nobody who looked like Bobby. I left that alone. That was it. Bobby Brown. Yeah, he had the studio down here, Boss Town, which is now owned by um, Outkast. They call it Stankonia. But before it was Stankonia, it was Boss Town. That was Bobby's. And then also Suge Knight was Bobby's security. Back in those days, this is going a long time ago, but yeah, Bobby he used to have all of the BMW station wagons, all of them. Speaking of Suge Knight, were you at the Source Awards at the Paramount Theater when Suge Knight gave his infamous speech? I was at the crib. I was in Atlanta when he did that, man. We was here. Um, yeah, I was in Atlanta. I think we watched that at the rim shot. I think I was in the basement in the rim shop when he was doing that Source Awards speech. Yeah. I'm going a little bit far into it, but did the bad boy artists, you know, when you were a part of the label, did bad boy artists resent, you know, Puff for being all up in the videos and having his voice all over the, the tracks or did they enjoy it? I think back then you would think that it was cool, but then, it might have been a few artists that was like, nah, I don't want that annoying stuff. Like, I don't really think he can be in all Faith songs because Faith might do a slow song and then he want to get in there. He can't do it. So I think this on songs that were maybe singles, he might have thought like me being on the single with you is going to give the song some appeal or whatever it may have been. And I mean, when you're an artist, you you want to do a song with Puff because you think that once you do that song with him, it's going to sell. But that's not necessarily the case. That's not it. Mm -mm, that didn't work. Is it true, if you know, is it true that Biggie was annoyed due to the amount of times Puffy made him say his name in raps like, I smoke blunts, Puff sips on the Baileys? Mm, I don't know Biggie that well to, to know how he felt about Puff in his lyrics or anything like that. In fact, it was interesting to hear you say that. I never really thought of it, but I'm sure as all artists, um, we grow tired of having that person that's, you know, when you say I can go to Arista and I can ask Arista about my money or I can ask them about an advance, but the only person that can contact Arista and talk to them or get an advance is you because they have a deal with you. They don't have a deal with me. So as an artist, you'd be like, man, I wish I could just have control over my own destiny. I just want to have a deal with the main label. So I think a lot of artists grew to that point in life where they was like, I don't want to have this middleman as a part of my deal now. It's too many times I'm calling to ask about a check. And they told me that they sent it to him. See, it's the thing. If Arista would give you a check or BMG, whatever it was, or Universal, when they would cut the check, the check would be cut to Janice Combs. And then Janice Combs 
as the um, publishing company, they, they then divide the check down to the producers and artists. And then they also look at budgeting, like this is how much we spent on your budget. This is how much we're withholding from your check because you're still in recoupment. You haven't recouped yet. So as an artist, you'd be like, damn, I just did a video. I got to recoup $2 million. Not me. But I think like Rob, he had to recoup a lot of money for his album. And you never know that until you'd be like, I got to recoup. You'd be like, what does recoup mean? And they'd be like, all of the money that we spent on videos, hotels, um, your rent and all of this stuff. You got to give us all of that money back before you make money. And you'd be like, well, what else do I got to pay for? They'd be like, you got to pay for this track that you did with this producer. You got to pay for this song that you did with him you got to pay for a puffy song and when he did this with you be like damn how much puffy charge puffy was like pharrell pharrell beats was a hundred thousand dollars a puffy feature that was pretty much up there too so that's just a way for him to say i'm an artist i'm also on the label and i want to pay myself as an artist how did you end up with a record deal and signing with Bad Boy? Because he called me one night and he was like, Playboy, I'm listening to your music and I want, I want, I want to sign you to my record label. He, he was like, this Puff Daddy. I was like, for real? He was like, yeah. And I said, he said, I'm going to fly you out tomorrow and we're going to talk. And I, next thing you know, I flew out the next morning. I went up to New York. He was like, yeah, welcome to Bad Boy, where dreams come true. I had all of this on video one time too when I first met him. It was a crock of mess. And um I lost the video, man. But when I first went there, we we was recording it because it was like a an experience for me and my friend, who was the producer at the time. And when, when he was like, Welcome to Bad Boy, where dreams come true. And then I was like, bam, and 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 I signed. And that was the worst decision I ever made in life, then man. I sh I shouldn't. I should have went with too short of somebody. I would have had longevity. But anyhow, it happened. So you actually said the day you signed with Diddy was the best day of your life, though. Can you? You thought would think that because you just signed to deal with somebody who you thought, if if you could sit back and think about what you thought. Next week, opposed to what you're thinking right now, you might think like everything is okay right now, but you won't know that things ain't all right till next week. So again, for now, it seems like a great thing to do. For the future and for later, it is not the best thing to do. So if living in the now might make me feel as if this is the greatest business opportunity in life. But when I look at myself today, and I realized what I could have done differently, I think I could have been, I had a better shot not signing to him. So tell me, man, what made it the best day of your life though? Who was there? What did you do? Was it like a stack of money? Was there a house? Was there a feature? Like, what was it? It's just knowing that he's all over TV and he's successful and that one day you're going to be as successful. He's going to make you the successful person like how he is. So you'd be like, man, everything that I want, I can win just by the opportunity. I didn't, he didn't have to give me anything. Just create the opportunity for me and I'll take it from there. So I was more about the opportunity, not about the smoke and the mirrors and all of that kind of stuff. You know, I went on the toys for, I went on the forever out tour when I first signed. He was like, yeah, I want to take you on tour with me. And so you could see what it's like to be on tour and live the life. So then, you know, me and my, my producer, we went on tour for the forever. And then we got on the tour. And then we was like, yo, we want to make some money while we out here too. And then he, he he gave me some tickets and was like, go out to this theater, to wherever we, we performing at today and go out early and try to sell the tickets. And then we'll go out there trying to sell tickets and probably be making $5 off of each ticket. For every ticket we didn't sell, I had to bring it back and be like, here, then they turn it back to Ticketmaster. See what he would do? He would buy out the front rows, right? And then sell the front row tickets on the, on, on the other market. And then 
sell them. And then the ones that he didn't sell, he'll turn it back into ticket masters. And then he'll have, like, I would be out there, a few people would be out there trying to sell them tickets before the show. Yeah, man, when he says come out here and live the life, I mean, I mean, I would expect you guys being in luxurious hotels, having cash to go out and shop every day to buy new clothes for the tours. Matter of fact, what I did, remember I told you my father said I wasn't the greatest drug dealer. So I said, Puff, we're going to, I can't do this. I said, I don't want to be out there selling tickets for $5 and stuff like that. I don't really care about $5 like that. You know what I'm saying? I was, and my partner, he was like, well, I, may, I ain't going to get you no more tickets, but I can get you these VIP passes. I said, how many VIP passes can you get me? He said, I'll give you five. I said, okay, I like that. So I took the five VIP passes, and I was selling the VIP passes for 500 a piece. So I make 2500 every stop just off of VIP passes, and I didn't have to give them nothing, right, until they noticed that the backstage at the end of the show was full of people they didn't know. He'd be like, who is this? And they'd be all in there with the VIP pass. They'd be like, how you get back here? They were like, he sold me the pass. I look, I'd be like, me? Boy, so then I knew after I sold the pass, one day they they shut off all the VIP access because too many people was coming showing up with these passes. I was making too much money. And then bam, I had sold some passes to some people. And I came down, they was like, Where did you get these passes from? They was like, We got them from him. I went and got on the tour bus and went to sleep. I wasn't giving the money back. Was no ref was no refund. So then that, that by that time, and that was the end of the tour. It was, it was over. So let me ask you, was Diddy's objective for you to be a ghostwriter, kind of like how he had 50 Cent and others doing that? I ain't never really signed up to be no ghostwriter. It just is because my songs were so hot, he wanted them as I made them. And then he was like, I could picture me singing that song. I was like, shoot. He was like, I'll buy it from you. I'm like, sold to the man in the shiny suit, just like that. Every time I got a hot song, won't buy it. Yep. Give me 25000 Give it to I'm good. I'm going to write another song tonight. Were you supposed to have a solo album, a debut like Black Rob or Mace had? Was that ever discussed? Yeah, that's what I was supposed to have. But then word on the street was allegedly that my budget had got messed up and I didn't have no budget. So I was like, what happened to my budget? And they was like, well, everybody budget got messed up. Sherry Dennis, everybody. I said, how did everybody budget get messed up? And they was like, yeah, because Puff went and did this bad boy for life video. He spent X amount of millions of dollars and he spent this on this video and he called it a compilation. So it's called Puff Daddy and the Family, which was supposed to be a compilation. But the second song off of the compilation was called Diddy. So I should have known then. I'm like, how in the world are we going to have a compilation album and the second album is called the second song is called diddy so then they was like yeah he spent all oh, y'all budget on that album and then we was like damn he was like playboy you better hope this album sells or we all gonna need we all gonna need a new deal because what happened they was going they dropped him they dropped puff from the from i think it was either universal or Arison. you gotta do the math on it and they dropped him and then after that he had to get picked up by another label another parent label but they dropped him because he had did that without getting their permission and that messed up everybody's budget so then when he came back and they was giving him new budgets he ain't really was like give mark curry a budget or he just had his whole new roster going get them that's just the way that he get the money they might give him 10 million however many millions he was getting in order to run the label but he owned the studio you're going to record in my studio with my producers and my writers. He's in the win-win. He get 50% of everything, don't he? 